All right, everybody, welcome to uh, Scranton City Council's caucus. Today is Tuesday, February 23rd, 2021. We're going to get started. Uh, we have a few guests here with us tonight from NeighborWorks of Northeastern Pennsylvania. Uh, NeighborWorks of Northeastern Pennsylvania, as everyone knows, does a lot of work um, in the city of Scranton, um, from the Beautiful Blocks program to the uh, West Scranton Neighborhood Plan, um, among a number of uh, different things that are really great for our city and for our community. Uh, so tonight we have uh, Todd Poosley, who is the Neighborhood Revitalization Manager for uh, NeighborWorks, and we also have Jesse Ergot, who is the Executive Director, and Gerard Hetman, um, who is the Community Development Specialist. So I'll turn it over to uh, you gentlemen uh, to update us on what's going on in our community with NeighborWorks. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. And thank you for this opportunity just to, uh, to meet with you and talk a little bit about some of the exciting uh, programs and, and projects that uh, NeighborWorks Northeastern Pennsylvania is undertaking uh, in partnership with the city of Scranton in many cases. So I'm Jesse Ergot, I'm the CEO as, uh, as was mentioned of NeighborWorks Northeastern Pennsylvania. Uh, Todd and Gerard are going to uh, take some time here and fill you in on some specifics on a few of the programs that we're currently working on. Uh, I know earlier today we sent over some information uh, via Lori about the uh, partnerships that we that we currently have in place uh, with the city for um, a number of the initiatives that that we're working on. Uh, we also send just some general information about our organization and the in the program lines and and the types of services we provide. So I won't spend uh, really any time um, going into detail on those because hopefully you have uh, those in front of you. Um, but um, we truly appreciate the opportunity just to, to, uh, to come before this group and, and talk about, again, some of these exciting uh, initiatives that we're undertaking in 2021. So uh, I wanna make sure we have enough uh, time for, you know, uh, for any questions that you may have on, on what's presented to you by Gerard and Todd. So I'm gonna turn it right over to them. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. And thank you to council for having us come in this evening, uh, virtually, of course. This is our going into now our third year of the Beautiful Blocks program, and it's our second year uh, speaking to council in a caucus format. So we're pleased to be with you this evening. As many of you are familiar with Beautiful Blocks, uh, the program is a residential neighborhood improvement program uh, that provides matching funding support to groups of Scranton residents to do exterior improvements to their homes and therefore improve their neighborhoods. Uh, so again, beautiful blocks, we make matching grant awards. We see groups of at least five Scranton residents uh, living in close proximity. They don't have to all be on the same block, but they do need to be relatively close. I would like to say within one turn or so around the block or to the next block to each other. Um, what that does is the improvements made make a concentrated, F, concentrated impact in the neighborhood, uh, both in terms of physical improvements, where instead of just seeing scattershot repairs here or there, you see numerous improvements made in a noticeable area. So that improves not just the look, but also the feel, the walkability, the usability of the neighborhood. Uh, it also promotes interaction between residents that grows resident leadership. So we get residents, some of whom have lived e near each other for decades, other of whom may have just moved in a year or two uh, recently. Um, they get talking, they get working, and they just become more neighborly. And that improves everything that we want to see in good neighborhoods, uh, from neighbors helping each other, uh, to just keeping the neighborhood clean and, and usable, walkable, functionable. It just makes a really good improvement uh, concentrated in those block groups that we award funding to. Uh, so going forward, the 2020 program was our second cycle, a really good year. Um, I'll turn it over to Todd here for just a moment. You'll see one of our resident groups, it's the Roundwood neighbors from uh, the St. Anne Street area in West Scranton. Um, and then we'll come back and talk a little bit more on some of the program specifics, but I'll let Todd share that video for just a minute. And uh, if I do this properly, you should be able to not only see it, but hear it as well. So if you, if you can't hear it when I start it, let me know. But uh, this is just a quick uh, kind of testimonial from some residents um, that I think sums up uh, both the tangible and the, the intangible impacts of the program. Okay, ready when you are. All right. So go ahead, Alice. I'll give us your name first with the spelling, first and last name. Okay, my name is Alice Coulson, A-L-I-C-E. C-A-U-L-S-O-N. It's Ann McNally, um, A-N-N-E. Nancy Noon, N-O-O-N-E. Sure, it's Mary, M-A-R-Y, O'Hara. O apostrophe, capital H-O-R-A. Okay, great. 
How did you find out about the beautiful blocks program? From Alice. I'm uh, probably the shortest living person on the block in the sense that I I'm here like 19 years. A lot of these neighbors have been here most of their lives. <laughs> well, tell us a little bit about the work that you had done here through your beautiful blocks grant. I had my uh, carpeting redone in the front and uh, really enhanced it because it was very old. I had um, the shrubbery taken down and river rock put all around it and um, stuff to keep the weeds from coming up. Um, we had concrete sidewalks put in. Um, we were we were in desperate need of sidewalks. These all the street was lined for probably since the, the beginning with um, big maple trees. And um, so the sidewalks were really, um, really atrocious. They were, they were dangerous. So originally I was going to replace both the doors. I ended up getting it refinished and um, ordered a new door, a storm door. Great, okay. What would you say that participating in the program has done for you? Have you enjoyed it? Have you talked to your neighbors more? Uh, definitely, we've talked more, you know, about it and everything. And it was, it was really a nice experience all the way around. It's been wonderful because it's uh, brought us together even more. You know, being able to talk about the grants and what everybody was doing and what we could do to enhance the neighborhood and just uh, brought us uh, more congeniality to the folks around. Most of us have been here for a long, long time and here 29 years, but there are a lot of new people in the neighborhood that uh, we're getting to know, and hopefully we can expand next year and move up, up and over. I was just going to say that you can already tell a difference here. I don't, maybe in my mind, but, um, but you can tell that, that people look at this block in a different way, like there's an energy, like something's going on here. And um, yeah, I can't even explain it. It's like something is happening here. And I just think like long term, it's, it's going to be awesome. Fantastic. Great. OK. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Gerard. Right. Thank you, Todd. Appreciate it. And you can see there again, one of our groups from our most recent cycle. And not just the physical improvements are what come through, but especially again, the connections and the cooperation between neighbors. I'm um, doing that in a safe way in this COVID environment, but uh, again, making connections and, and growing bonds in the neighborhood to do good things and keep neighborhoods clean and safe and said walkable and, and great places to live. So in our first two cycles combined, we've seen a great impact in our neighborhoods. Over our first two years, we've seen a total of 183 household projects completed. So some of those between year to year were returning, uh, but we did have a lot of new folks in our second year. Uh, we do set up the program so that for years two and now in year three, we require uh, groups to have at least some new participants. So we don't want to discourage returnees, but we also want to make sure that they're growing in their leadership and inviting new residents in to be a part of the process and make improvements. Uh, so we've seen a total of 25 of those block groups organized uh, containing those residents. So again, first years especially uh, was our start, but then the second year we saw great growth throughout the city, interest in all neighborhoods. Uh, so we're thrilled to see that, that process develop. A total of $156,397.15 in grant awards made in those first two cycles. So we see great investment in the neighborhoods with the support of the city and our other funding partners. But really the matching amount contributed by neighbors is tremendous. Uh, we've seen in our first two years, again, a total of $332,569.36 contributed by residents on addition to their grant funding. So some projects are smaller and they meet the minimum matching requirement, but oftentimes they go above and beyond and we see a really good uh, return on investment with the program. So going forward again, the first year we had funding support from the city of Scranton, United United. Uh, excuse me, University of Scranton, Scranton Area Community Foundation, NeighborWorks America, and Johnson College. So we thank all of our funding partners. And heading into 2021, uh, some good changes to make the program even more accessible and some more neighborhood leadership growth. Uh, that includes our matching requirement for this year uh, will be a 50-50 match up to $1,000 for participating households. So somebody does a $2,000 project in total cost, that means we'll contribute a thousand. They have to match that with a thousand dollars of their own. Uh, if they want to do more, as you can see, many of these neighbors have done with a higher dollar amount. They can certainly do that, but our match stops at a thousand dollars. Now, with the change for this year is there's a reduced matching requirement 
uh, for households below 80% of the area median income. Uh, so that means that those households will only have to match 20%. So if they do a you know, project where we award them $1,000, they would only have to match that with $200 of their own money uh, for a $1,200 total cost. We think that makes that a little bit more accessible uh, to some residents who otherwise may not be, have, be able to participate. It uh, just opens a door, hopefully, to more residents getting in and getting involved with their neighbors. Uh, the second item to come out that I'll mention is uh, kind of a byproduct of our participation in neighborhood uh, community development and revitalization. For the first time this year, we have a team of 10 resident leaders from the city, all city residents, participating in the Community Leadership Institute program through NeighborWorks America. So we've got 10 community leaders, uh, different folks with different backgrounds from neighborhoods throughout the city uh, who are learning and growing and working together, learning through NeighborWorks America community development training that's provided virtually. And later this year, they'll be working together on a community service project to make a difference in the city. Out of our 10 team, lead, team participants, four of them participated in Beautiful Blocks last year. So we see a direct relationship there. Members of Beautiful Blocks teams are not just making their improvements on their block, but they're also coming to us saying, hey, we want to be able to grow, participate more in resident and community leadership. And uh, it's fun when you watch the NeighborWorks America trainings from all over the country and you see mayors and council members and other folks active in their community who were uh, past Community Leadership Institute participants where they live. So we're not just making the physical improvements, but we're also growing leadership between neighbors and building resident leadership in our community here in the city of Scranton. It's an incredibly exciting thing. If you can't tell, I'm, I'm excited about this. So uh, going forward, we're open now with beautiful blocks or pre-applications. Uh, residents can access our website, www.nwnepa.org, or find it on our social media, Facebook and Twitter pages, uh, links to our pre-application instructions, and also our Google Doc that has our uh, pre-application form ready to be filled out. Uh, March 15th is the deadline for that. And again, that provides preliminary information. And then April 30th is our next deadline for our uh, full applications. That's where participants, uh, applicants provide a little bit more information. Um, and then we hope to meet uh, early May after the April 30th deadline for the full applications. Early May, we'll meet with our selection committee and we hope to notify everybody of their status by mid-May. November 1st is our final date uh, for project completion. So we're thankful for the city's continued funding support in the program. Um, also, the Neighborhood Assistance Program, we've received tax credit funding through that this year, which is a great asset. We've also applied for CDBG funding uh, to make the program even a little bit more accessible. So we're hoping that that will also be a part of the mix uh, for this year. And uh, we're happy to have council support with both Neighborhood uh, you know, Community Leadership Institute and also Beautiful Blocks. Uh, if council members want an up-close look at the program, they're welcome to meet with our Beautiful Blocks teams once they're selected especially at the start of the process, it'd be great to have uh, someone from council talk to our groups. Um, and also again, throughout the program, always welcome to provide an update and meet with some of those groups as the process continues. And with our CLI team, also especially again, seeing resident leadership in action, we'd love to have council's participation, maybe in some of our meetings with the team. Uh, one council member wanted to be kind of a liaison, we'd welcome that, but all members are certainly welcome to uh, engage with our team and we'd be happy to have your input and uh, use you guys as some good role models for for resident leadership. So uh, that's all I have on Beautiful Blocks and our Community Leadership Institute team. So I'll turn that over to Todd now. He'll tell you a little bit about our neighborhood work in West Scranton and our Hometown Heroes program. Great, thanks Gerard. Uh, any questions about Beautiful Blocks before I, I jump into West Scranton? Uh, I have a question. I just want a uh, <clears throat> testament. I mean, I, I live on the 11 block of St. Anne Street. So these were my neighbors that participated. They were very excited. Um, they're very happy with this whole program and, and they have some good neighbors here. So thanks. Yeah, my only question and, and to help people that are watching uh, understand the program is any blocks or any um, areas you're really targeting. I know you're looking at West side, but any particular areas in general that you're, you're looking to get into this time around. Sure. So councilman, the program is open uh, to all city residents. Uh, so we do not, you know, certainly uh, it's not restricted to any one neighborhood or one section of the city. Uh, certainly one thing we're trying to do this year is engage um, with populations in the city that may not have had, uh, you know, participated in the past. So we, you know, we've done outreach to uh, different programs that we run here uh, through our other lines of service and some of our other partner agencies that we work with trying to identify uh, populations that may not have participated, uh, particularly some of our, our newer communities in terms of folks who may have just moved here. Um, we see different um, ethnic groups, you know, in the city building a 
great communities and we'd love to have uh, more participation from some of those neighborhoods. So uh, if council, any members of council or your office or anyone else in, in the city administration has any advice for us, uh, potential contacts where we can spread the word, we'd certainly appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, Gerard, wasn't there a change made last year um, to in include renters if they were interested in participating in the program or am I? No, you, that's correct. So the first year of the program was open only to owner occupied households. Uh, but the second year we did allow for um, rental properties to be part of the groups. Uh, so we saw some rental properties and that was great. Um, you know, we often encountered folks last year and even some coming in this year who were concerned because there are rental properties on their block, uh, those properties may not be eligible. So uh, in order to include those properties, uh, we certainly we made that change and we saw some good results. Actually, one of those roundwood projects that you saw in the video was a, there were some rental properties there that participated and made a good impact. So it, it is open to, to rental properties. Great, thank you. Great, thanks. Um, I'll, I'll jump into uh, our work in West Scranton and then uh, be happy to hopefully leave a, a few minutes for a couple of couple more questions. Um, we've been spending uh, the, the better part of, of the past two years um, doing some neighborhood planning work in Westside, um, funded by the Wells Fargo Regional Foundation. Um, we, uh, we've been engaging residents, business owners, stakeholders in that community um, to develop a 10-year revitalization plan. Um, and we're, uh, we're happy to share that uh, we wrapped up that plan um, and released it in the fall. Um, so tonight I just wanted to take you through um, some of the highlights. Um, I'm sure you'll all be very disappointed. I did not bring the full 150 page plus plan uh, to share with you tonight, but I've got some of the highlights here uh, from a, I think a, a 10 page version um, that I'm going to uh, kind of breeze through with you. Um, as I mentioned, we spent uh, a considerable amount of time engaging residents in the neighborhood. Um, what we didn't want to do is uh, develop a plan with uh, lots of things that we thought uh, would be good improvements for the neighborhood without uh, talking to the people who live there and work there and own businesses there. So um, we were real intentional about engaging as many different people in the neighborhood as possible. Um, we did that in a variety of ways. One of, that, one of those ways was through a door-to-door -door survey. Uh, we actually sent out volunteers uh, for, the, for the better part of, uh, of a summer um, and uh, had them knock on doors. Um, I think we had somewhere close to uh, 200 people uh, respond to the survey. Um, and we learned a lot about their experiences living there, what some of their concerns were, what some of the opportunities were in the neighborhood. Um, and all of that inf information informed uh, the strategies in our, in our final neighborhood plan. Um, to give you a, a quick recap, we, we collected lots of data through the, the surveying. Uh, some of the things that uh, folks tended to like about the neighborhood, um, just uh, the people who live there for one, which is uh, always a great starting point. Um, you'll be happy to know that uh, most of them told us that the quality of the public services, police, fire, ambulance service, garbage, uh, things like that um, were, uh, were satisfactory. Uh, some of the things that uh, they thought needed improvement were uh, really around some of the physical conditions of the neighborhood. So, um, you know, the condition of, of streets and sidewalks came up, uh, blight came up a lot, um, vacant, abandoned properties, things like that, um, which are all uh, things we're going to try to address through this plan. Um, as I mentioned, time and time again, people told us that the, the reason they lived there was the other people who lived in the neighborhood. 58% um, in fact uh, believe that they could work with their neighbors to solve uh, some of their own community problems. Um, at the same time, uh, we also heard in general that uh, most people thought things weren't really changing in the neighborhood um, and that they didn't really expect things to change much um, in the future. Um, so, you know, we, we took that as, uh, you know, there, there might be a little bit of apathy in, in the neighborhood. There might be a little bit of, um, you know, just, just some hesitation um, some sense that, uh, you know, although they might want to make improvements to the community, they didn't kind of know where to start. So we're approaching the, the plan in, in that, um, you know, in that vein. Uh, through the planning process, we, we kind of identified five different uh, target areas um, in, in the neighborhood that we wanted to focus on, and I'll go over uh, each of those quickly. Uh, the, the focus areas um, in, in general for the strategies uh, kind of broke down into uh, these four here. First is community character. That's the things about the neighborhood that make it unique, um, say from other neighborhoods in, in the city. 
the commercial corridors, uh, in this case, Main Avenue and, and Luzerne Street are primary commercial corridors. So uh, we focused on those and, and what we could do to support the businesses there. Uh, services and amenities in general. Um, so those are the, the community services that are, are available to uh, the residents of, of Westside, um, along with things like parks, schools, the open spaces, um, things like that, that uh, you know, folks would consider amenities in the neighborhood. Housing is the fourth category, of course. Um, and then each, in each of these categories, we developed um, some specific strategies. I'm not gonna go through all of those uh, tonight, um, but uh, I'll be happy to kind of share at the end here where you can find um, the, the full version of the plan. Um, what I do want to do is uh, show you, uh, you know, some of the things that I think are, are most exciting about this plan. And that's kind of taking a look at the, the districts that I had mentioned. Um, and each of those, we identified a, a catalyst site um, where, you know, we heard from residents, business owners that um, if a little bit of improvement was made at, at these catalyst sites, it could have a big impact on the neighborhood. Uh, the first is the avenue. So that's uh, focused on, on Main Avenue. Uh, the picture you see here is, uh, is uh, uh, one of the parks, Allen Park, uh, one of the pocket parks on Main Avenue at, at the intersection with Price Street. Um, there's also a municipal parking lot across the street. So uh, we're, we're kind of imagining some improvements, you know, modest improvements to the park, some improvements to the parking lot across the street as well. Um, some safety improvements at that intersection so that uh, people can make it uh, safely across the street, either to the park or to some of the businesses on the other side of, of Main Avenue. Um, that's a pretty um, pretty hairy little intersection to uh, and, and part of Main Avenue to cross um, from the parking lot if you need to. The uh, second catalyst site here is, is in the crossroads, what we're calling the crossroads area, which is right around the intersection of Main Avenue and Luzerne Street. Um, there's actually a handful of vacant lots here um, owned by the Lackawanna County Land Bank um, that we worked with them to clean up recently. Um, and uh, this is kind of what we imagine they could be in, in the future. Um, and that's a combination of uh, potentially some new housing uh, along with some community space. This is um, pretty close to the uh, high school. So um, we'd love to uh, find some ways that we could engage some students um, that they could use this uh, you know, as a, either as a place to um, you know, hang out, spend a little bit of time, um, you know, possibly in incorporate into uh, their curriculum through community gardens and things like that. <clears throat> we have Luzerne Corners, um, which, which is focused on you know, the other part of Luzerne Street, um, where it uh, intersects with Meridian Avenue, and there's a, a large shopping center down there, um, where, uh, again, we imagine some uh, kind of modest short-term improvements um, to, uh, to the parking lots, the streetscape, sidewalk improvements, things along those lines. Um, and then even some longer term uh, sort of reimagining of what that shopping plaza could actually look like. Um, and, uh, you know, potentially incorporating some housing, maybe some senior housing, which is one of the things that we heard uh, from residents was needed in the neighborhood. Uh, the Clover Industrial District, that's uh, sort of what we're, we're calling the area where we've got uh, kind, of, kind of some industrial businesses along with Clover Field, um, you know, which in our estimation and, and what we heard from uh, a lot of the residents just isn't as well utilized as it could be. Um, it's definitely an asset, uh, a pretty large city park, um, but uh, there, there aren't a whole lot of amenities right there um, or, or there right now. So, um, you know, we're, we're looking into some ways that we could um, possibly add some amenities there, whether it's just um, some different recreational opportunities, things like a basketball court or tennis court, um, playground, uh, you know, things along those lines. And then finally, um, our, what we're calling the, the South Main Gateway Medical Corridor. Um, this is uh, kind of the, the, as we get to the outskirts of, of the city, right before you get into Taylor here, um, off of uh, Main Avenue, where there's been uh, some significant private development already. Um, and some medical businesses that have moved in. Uh, this is also the area of the neighborhood that uh, we're pleased to have just moved into ourselves. We've relocated our office um, from uh, North Scranton uh, down into West Side uh, as part of our, our long-term revitalization work here. Uh, so we recently moved in. We're looking forward uh, post-pandemic to, uh, to getting uh, have, having, a, having a little block party there um, and, and inviting folks over to uh, actually see and, and use the new space. All of this uh, leads to implementation, uh, which is where we're at right now. So I just wanted to briefly uh, mention, um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now, a couple of projects um, that we're working on 
um, as, uh, as part of the, the first steps of implementing this plan. It's a 10-year a plan, so um, we've got a lot of work ahead of us, but um, some of the things you might have noticed already, um, we completed a mural at Catalano's um, back in the, in the summer, uh, which a lot of folks uh, have, have enjoyed. Um, we're also embarking on a, a creative crosswalks project. We got a little bit of money from um, Lackawanna County through their arts and culture department, along with the Moses Taylor Foundation um, to uh, do some what we call creative crosswalks. They're not your typical white striped crosswalks, but um, kind of imagine like a mural on the street. Um, so they act as you know, a, a pedestrian safety mechanism. Um, we get you know, easier for folks to cross the street, um, but they also inject a little bit of art into the community. Um, I mentioned the Luzerne Street uh, lot cleanup. So we've got those lots cleaned up um, and we're looking to do now uh, a full site plan to, to sort of figure out what we wanna do with those properties. Um, we're also focused on some commercial corridor improvements. Um, I mentioned the parking lot across from uh, Allen Park that we're focused on. Uh, we did put in a CDBG application for that as well to uh, work with the city and make some improvements there. Um, and then finally, uh, we're going to be applying for a designation called the Keystone Communities designation, um, which uh, if you're familiar with the Main Street and the Elm Street programs, um, this is uh, just a, a similar designation uh, that kind of combines the two programs. So. Um, and that does require a, uh, a resolution letter of support from the, the city. So um, likely in the next couple of months, um, city council will be uh, seeing a request from us uh, you know, for your support for that designation. Um, and then finally, I wanted to wrap up here. Um, you know, couldn't, couldn't end here without mentioning um, the Hometown Heroes Project, um, which is uh, a project uh, Councilman McAndrew, uh, I, I know has, has shepherded and, and uh, been a proponent of. Um, and uh, we've been fortunate to work with him and a team at Leadership Lackawanna uh, to actually get it up and, and off the ground. So um, the Leadership Lackawanna team is working right now um, to uh, kind of design the program for us. Um, and the idea is that we will pilot it in West Scranton, um, kind of launch it publicly around Memorial Day. Um, and then after that, uh, hand it over to the city and, and expand it citywide. So um, it's, a, it's a program you're probably familiar with, lots of other uh, municipalities uh, near Scranton have them. Um, it's a banner program to recognize uh, veterans. And um, it's, uh, it's we sort of announced uh, recently and uh, applications aren't ready just yet, but will be soon, but we've already received a, a whole lot of interest about it. So um, we're excited to launch that. Um, and I uh, hope some of you will be able to join us for, for a little launch event around Memorial Day. Um, I'm going to uh, wrap up there. Um, I hopefully have a, a few minutes here if anybody has um, any questions, but thanks again for, for the opportunity to provide, uh, provide the update. Um, you know, we're really excited about uh, all the work we've been able to do with the city, all the work we're gonna continue to do with the city going forward. Thanks, Todd, that was great. Um, does anybody have any questions for Todd, Jesse, or Gerard? I just have one question. So um, the, the presentation you just gave, especially on the, the West Grant revitalization, it was really exciting. I mean, that, that is just uh, a really exciting plan. It's a, it's a great way to um, revitalize that area. So what, in your opinion, are the biggest hurdles that you encounter as an organization trying to implement a plan like that um, over a 10 year period? Um, good question. Uh, I, I would say, you know, for one, because it is so long range, you know, these are projects that, um, you know, are, are will, will likely take multiple years to develop. Some of the some of the ones you know projects I, I just described are kind of quicker early implementation projects that we can get up and off the ground right away. But um, you know, when we're talking about you know taking um, almost a full city block of, of vacant blighted properties, cleaning them up and redeveloping them, um, that's going to be something that's going to take a long time. So um, it's pulling together the partners, um, you know, getting all the the right people at the table, um, and pulling together the the funding. Um, long term to, to make these projects a, a success. Um, you know, we recognize that, you know, this, this is a neighbor works plan. You know, this is, this is the city's plan. This is the neighborhood's plan. Um, you know, we aren't the only ones that are going to be working to accomplish these things. Our role, we see it is, you know, bringing all of the, the partners to the table um, to work with the city, uh, you know, to, to make these changes. And, and so far we've had a lot of success with that. I agree. Thank you. And the vision is there, which I think is really important. Um, so, we we consider us a, as always a partner in that, and um, you know I, I just I really appreciate the work that all of you have done. Um, it's it's really phenomenal. Great. 
great stuff. Um, does anybody Thank else you. have any questions? Yeah, I guess. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, go ahead, Kyle. I just have one quick one. Um, did you say where we could get a copy of the full report? Uh, you can get a copy on our website, um, so okay. nepa.org. Um, I would be happy to send uh, both the, the full report and the highlights version. I can send links to Lori and, and have her um, send those out to, to all the council members. Great. Thank you. And thank you for all the work you're doing over there. I think this is great. Absolutely. So, yeah, all the projects look great. When I'm looking at, you know, the main avenue sections, um, I know that land is is, is land that's ready to be uh, revitalized and the, the piece from the land grant over on Luzerne Street is, um, is owned by the land bank. When I'm looking at uh, the Clover piece, which is, uh, it's a big expanse there. Is all of, is all of that land um, available to be revitalized or does any of that land need to be purchased off any, any landowners in that area or it's all, it's all open at this point in time? Sorry, which, uh, which area were you referring to? Over near Clover Field. Oh, Cloverfield. Um, yeah, so so the park itself um, is is city owned. Um, some of the areas around there are um, you know in, industrial businesses. Um, so uh, you know we, we're going to be reaching out to them. Um, you know what we're looking for basically is um, you know to uh, you know hopefully work with them as kind of good neighbors in, in the neighborhood. Um, to, uh, you know, make some improvements, not just to the park, but, um, you know, some, uh, some of the exteriors, fences and things along, along their businesses. So um, the park itself, uh, you know, is, is owned by the city, but um, some of those other areas are, are owned by some of the businesses. Okay. And then one, one question I actually got in was for the Beautiful Box program, um, is it only five neighbors or more than five could be involved in that project? Or the better, Councilman. Uh, we require a minimum of five neighbors, but uh, we do encourage uh, more. Uh, certainly, you know, we did see some groups come in with, you know, five or, or a few more than that. We also saw groups last year of, you know, 15, 17, 18 uh, participating households. So they, you know, are, that's how we encourage groups to do more. Uh, if they can, it spreads the benefit and uh, gets more neighbors involved. So uh, please, if people want more, they can certainly, certainly do more than five. Uh, it's most welcome. All right, great. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for, for coming tonight and for providing us with an update. I'm always excited to hear about um, what you guys have in the works uh, with NeighborWorks because I think it's, um, it's really helping the, the neighborhoods and the community. Um, I think the 10-year plan for Westside is, is very exciting. Um, and so I was happy to get more details on that. And then Gerard, I know you had mentioned um, about uh, if any council members want to come down or meet the teams. And I'm always happy to do that. And as a former participant in, um, in the Beautiful Blocks program too, prior to my um, serving on council, uh, you know, I'm happy to meet other, uh, other neighbors who are doing the same. Thank you, Be great. And I just want to say a, a big thank you again to all of you for, for the support and uh, for the time that you've given us, you know, as you can tell, we have a, a fantastic team with, with uh, Gerard and Todd kind of spearheading a lot of these programs and a lot of other uh, things that we do in partnership with the city, like the Scranton Homebuyer Program and, and some other things that we work on with OECD. So we're excited about the momentum that's being built um, through this partnership. You know, we've, we've had a almost 40 year history here of, of working in the city and, and looking forward to many, many more um, positive and productive uh, years ahead. And, um, you know, the, what you're seeing is just kind of a, uh, a little piece of, of what we do, but, you know, we couldn't do it without the partnership and support of, of council and the city administration and, and many other partners. So we truly, truly appreciate it. I don't know. I don't have any uh, questions, but I have a, a couple of comments. Um, as a West Sider, I'm thrilled with the West Side plan. Are you kidding me? It, it's, it's, it's fantastic. Everybody uh, is excited about it. Um, but I also want to applaud you for all the other work you've done throughout the city and you continue to do. So thanks for coming. Thanks for updating us. And of course, we look forward to working with you. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Anyone else uh, like to add anything? Okay. Gentlemen, thank you so much. Hope you have a good night and uh, we'll stay in touch. Thank you. You too. Thanks. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. Thank you. Okay, everybody, uh, we have about 10 minutes left before our regular meeting. Um, so we have a, a couple things on the agenda tonight. The 
the one that you know maybe we'll spend the next 10 minutes talking about because it was a point of contention before the end of last year was the uh, contract for the delinquent refuse collection with uh, Portnoff. Um, so that is back on our agenda, agenda item 5C. So I've been talking with uh, Kevin uh, today and, and uh, before today when we knew this was going to be on the agenda, just going through this and um, highlighting uh, the points that um, uh, council had asked uh, for some you know, things to be included if this contract were to be put back on the agenda. Those things were, for the most part, included. Um, so, Kevin, do you want to just now go through this contract and update us on uh, what has been changed from uh, when we entertained this back in December? Sure. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, the re revised agreement uh, that was submitted by the law department for Portnoff incorporates most of the changes that you all requested be made. Um, and to give you just a brief overview of those, uh, it was important for us that the agreement specifically spell out the scope of Portnoff's uh, retention, which is to, to, to collect the, the delinquent refuse fees for 2002 to 2020. They included that language. That wasn't in the initial submission. It was important for council that the um, that Portnoff be held uh, accountable under the city ordinances and especially the Ethics Act. Uh, so that was at it. Uh, it was important for council uh, that we had not have a situation where the collector of these refuse fees are accumulating yeah. enormous costs and attorney fees in furtherance of the collection um, of these refuse fees so that we would be placed so that we so that we could avoid a situation where we um, if we ever wanted to terminate this agreement, the city, we wouldn't have to first buy out the vendor by paying them, paying off all the attorney fees and costs that they had accumulated uh, through through the, the course of the contract. So what we proposed uh, and they accepted is that they're not allowed to, we, we will not be held accountable for anything in excess of, of $50,000. So in other words, at no, po at no point in time can they uh, accumulate attorney fees and costs in excess of $50,000. Um, and we won't be responsible for, for, we would never be responsible for, for, for satisfying uh, or paying those fees if this, if this contract was to terminate. However, what they added is any fees that they accumulate in excess of $50,000, which would include the $40 account initiation fee, which they discussed, we the city would not have to pay that back until we received payment by the collection, by the property owner um, for, the, for the delinquent fee. So in other words, they could accumulate fees in excess of 50,000, but the city's not gonna be held responsible. The city will not have to pay that to Portnoff should the contract terminate. Instead, it'll be paid back to Portnoff when, uh, those it, when and if those fees were ever collected um, against the, those against the property owners who had the delinquent fees and which Portnoff uh, had started, so we didn't get a hundred percent of what we want there. But they came back and said, "You're, you're not going to be yes, we we're, we may accrue fees in excess of fifty thousand dollars, but you're not. But the city's not going to be held responsible for paying those back uh, should this contract terminate." Um, and, and we all know what type of situation we're trying to avoid here without getting specific. Um, so that, those are the major changes. Uh, most of, you know, we, we basically, the only, the only minor stuff that we didn't get that we had proposed is that we, you know, we had proposed terminating the agreement with 60 days notice, uh, I'm sorry, with notice 60 days prior to the expiration of the term, which will be December 31 every year. They, they held it at 90. Um, so if there's any concern, questions or concerns, you can ask me now. You can ask me uh, through the course of the next few days and I can go back to the law department to see, to, to see if, any, if there's, a, there's room for negotiation um, with Portnoff on this agreement. Kevin, uh, thank you for that. Um, in section two under the term, um, yes. so 
the city and Port Off would have the option to renew, um, but they'd have to give each other 90 days notice. And the way that I'm reading this is it would also be subject to approval by council, correct? Correct. Okay, so that's actually, that's a good thing. We wanted that, I wanted that specifically in there because under the old agreement, um, it just automatically renewed. So right. if you have a transition between administrations or something, you know, unfortunately, sometimes that might get lost mm. in the shuffle. So I thought that was important. Right, so yeah, that's a good point. Uh, and, and so the, if a lot of part, if the administration wants to, con to continue the relationship and, and if Portnoff wants to continue a relationship, they have to get legislation before us, um, uh, you know, as, 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 you know, by what, uh, by, I guess, by September 31st. Right. So, or I'm sorry, by August 31st. So, um, yeah, that, 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 that is a good provision. So we have an active role in deciding whether this contract uh, continues. Okay. Uh, we have about four minutes left in the caucus. We'll continue this conversation uh, during the regular meeting. But with the four minutes left, does anybody have any specific questions for Kevin on um, the Portnoff contract? Yeah, and I mean, there was a couple things that I asked for, and it looks like they've been put in here. Um, one of the things was a non-performance clause, and it seems that Section 16 covered the non-performance. Is that satisfactory to you, Kevin? Um, so we added all of that language, yes. So that was, they accepted all, that is basically all the language that we drafted, uh, paragraph 16, except for the last phrase that says, um, subject to the $50,000 or, um, or costs in excess of $50,000 being, being paid by the city upon, co upon collection thereof by the city or the city's third party collector. That's all, that's all of our proposed language that they accept it. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, the, the few things that I asked for, it seems like that are in there. Um, was there any discussion about that? Um, I mean, I don't think we want to call it amnesty, but um, I'm, you know, when we're looking at this, they're going to take what a 15% uh, fee from any collections. Right. Mm -hmm. um, was there any discussion of I, this? I mean, this isn't what we're talking about right now. We're talking about the agreement, but um, you know, I'm looking just to see, you know, anything that's out there right now, if that gets brought in to us, um, the city's getting hundred percent of that money um, rather than, um, subject to those fees. So I don't know if there has been any discussion about that. So um, all the discussions directly with Portnoff are with the law department. So I would, the way it's, it flowed is that I gave my requested revisions or council's requested revisions to the law department, and then they shared them with Portnoff and what we got back was largely what we requested. So, um, but I was not a party to any discussions regarding any the amnesty or grace period at all. Now, thank you for that. Cause yeah, everything that I think was asked for is, is in there. Um, yeah, so that's all I have. Oh, yeah. Okay. Very good. Any other questions? Okay. All right, we'll take a two minute break here before our regular meeting and uh, then we'll, we'll start and we'll continue that discussion in uh, fifth order. Okay, thanks everybody. I'd like to call this public meeting of Scranton City Council Tuesday, February 23rd, 2021 to order. Would everyone please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please remain standing for a moment of silent reflection for our servicemen and women throughout the world, and also for those who have passed away in our community, especially former city councilwoman, Mary Walsh Dempsey's father, Thomas Walsh, who passed away on Friday. We must also take a somber moment of silence tonight to mark the passing of over 500,000 people in the United States from the COVID-19 pandemic. Over 400 of our own here in Lackawanna County have tragically had their life taken too soon from this virus. Let us remember not to become numb to this extraordinary loss of life. It's easy to forget that within that death toll that we see on television or read in the newspaper every single day, that it represents someone's father, mother, grandfather, grandmother, son, daughter, Please pray for the families that have been shattered because of this virus and continue to have faith and hope 
that better days are ahead. Thank you. <clears throat> Roll call, please. Mr. Schuster? Present. Mr. McAndrew? Present. Dr. Rothschild? Here. Mr. Donahue? Here. Mr. Gone? Here. Please dispense with the reading of the minutes. Third order, 3A, check received from Comcast in the amount of $255,513.11 for quarterly franchise fee. 3B, controller's report for month ending January 31, 2021. 3C, Lackawanna County Planning Commission Subdivision and Land Development Evaluation Report, reviewed January 15, 2021. 3D, Lackawanna County Planning Commission Subdivision and Land Development Evaluation Report, review January 25, 2021. 3E, Lackawanna County Planning Commission Ordinance Amendment Evaluation Report, review January 25, 2021. 3F, correspondence sent to Mayor Paige G. Cognetti, dated February 18, 2021. 3G, Minutes of the Scranton Police Pension Commission meetings held December 16, 2020 and January 20, 2021. 3H, minutes of the non-uniform Municipal Pension Board meeting held January 20, 2021. 3I, agenda for the non-uniform Municipal Pension Board meeting held February 17, 2021. Do any council members have any announcements at this time? Or I'm sorry, are there any comments on any of the third order items at this time? If not received and filed, do any council members have any announcements at this time? I do. Um, the Ancient Order of Hibernians, JFK Division One, Scranton, PA. Um, they're a great bunch of lads and lassies are having uh, a Division One spaghetti dinner. And it is Saturday, April 17th, uh, 2021. It's going to be at the Laceworks Tap and Grill. All right. Uh, tickets are 10, I think they're $10. I'm not sure about that. But they're, they're available on the AOH um, website, uh, also Laceworks and the dugout. And also, I'd like to wish my colleague and friend, Kyle Donahue, Councilman Donahue, a big happy birthday today. Uh, I'm glad to see you guys are starting to catch up to me. A couple birthdays recently. And that is all I have. Thank you. Any other announcements? Okay. Happy birthday, Kyle. 25, 26, I think, right? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Happy birthday. All right. Mrs. Reed. Fourth order, citizens participation. At this time, uh, would someone please make a motion to accept public comment from the following individuals, Patricia Nestor and Faye Franis? Make a motion to accept public comment. Second. There's been a motion and a second to accept public comment. Um, Mrs. Reed, would you please read the comments into the record? Thank you. The first submission is from Patricia Nestor as follows. If the housing in Scranton is so affordable as you all claim, why is Weston Field turned into a homeless shelter? Hasn't anyone told them? The second submission is submitted by Faye Franis as follows. Council, last Tuesday, February 16, 2021, I emailed you my questions. Two very specific questions that I asked to be answered. Mr. Gauhan deliberately did not answer. Why? Because he can and he always does. Tonight, the citizens may hear more spin and sidesteps from Mr. Gohan. It is a shame we, the citizens, have to wait yet another week to come back and address things Mr. Gohan evades at the meetings before. It's 
a definite pattern. I shall give you an example. Mr. Gawhan, when I asked weeks ago to try to help the people of Bellevue with the trucks, he went on his lecture tour telling me council does not do this type of work and that you are there to pass legislation and not to enforce them. Only the city can do that. Then in his next breath, he went on to say, council has directed the police to enforce the signs on third Avenue. Now I am paraphrasing there, but I certainly can get Mr. Gawhan's exact words. He was asking the police to help out, which is good, but he made it a point to let me know he cannot do that. Check city council minutes of the meeting. You can see Mr. Gawhan's exact words. I am fully aware of what council can and cannot do, but I also know they can also step in and help the city with these issues in Bellevue if they so choose. Back to last week, I asked why does council not allow citizens to zoom in live to ask their questions and get their answers live during the meeting. I also asked what can council do to help the people make this possible. I also said other meetings have citizens zoom into their meetings to address their comments and questions. To this response came my little lecture again. Mr. Gawain said council likes getting emails and encourages everyone to write in and he gave out the email and street address to write them in. He then went on to say, we try to answer all the questions. Well, at that point, I just thought what a smooth political statement. That was not true at all. Bill Gawain does, excuse me, did not answer my question at all. He completely kept jabbering about how people can write in and they have been doing this since the pandemic. I know all this. We all know this. What I want to know is why can't we zoom into the meetings live to ask our questions? Not a peep out of Mr. Gawain about that. Why? Because council does not want us asking questions live because they would not want to have to answer them. What's more, they do not want to have to be put on the spot. If I, if I were at that meeting last week, there is no way I would have immediately said, Mr. Gawden, you have not answered my question. And guess what? He either would have to or he would not. But he would be seen for what he is. This council has gotten away with so many shady replies. They know they can get away with it because we are not there to rebut them on the spot. So, yes, I would like an answer to that question. And since you get our emails before the meeting, you certainly have time to reread my questions from last week and you have time to figure out how to reply to this email so you get the last word again. This cat and mouse game is very frustrating. All this coming back a week later to challenge you on your replies from the week before would never need to happen if the citizens were able to zoom into the meeting live to ask our question, then we would just click off. Is that actually asking too much? And no, we do not want to wait until the summer or early, or early fall. That's a cop out, just to answer my questions. When you have people speak at a caucus, they get zoomed in very easily. So why can't we? Simple question. The other question you refused to answer was why is Scranton classified as a 2A city? I did not believe there were enough people in Scranton to qualify as a 2A city. I also said even after the census is completed, Scranton still will not have enough people to be uh, a city. Even if you didn't know, you could have offered to find out for me, but Mr. Gordon said nothing. When Janet Evans was president of city council, never once did she give people lectures and tell them we are only here to legislate. You have to call the city. Janet Evans, Frank Joyce, and attorney Boyd Hughes stayed at those meetings sometimes until 10 p.m. Why? Because they made it a point to answer everyone's questions. And if they had to go to the administration to find things out, they did. They never once asked a citizen to do a right to know request. They also never deliberately refused to answer anyone's questions, hoping maybe it might not be brought up again. Mr. Gawhan, I have never seen anyone as thin skinned as you. You can never be wrong. You can't handle being questioned about why you didn't do certain things, which are many, by the way. So if by chance, Mr. Gawain, you actually answer my questions, I will be grateful. If you don't, I will be right back here next week talking yet again about what you didn't answer this week. Don't you get tired of making excuses instead of speaking the truth? Try it sometime. You may find it refreshing. And that is all the public comment for this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Reed. Uh, 
Anyone on the question? Um, on the question, and that, you know, going to get into the back and forth with Ms. Franis on some of the bizarre things that the manifesto that you wrote into us tonight. Um, but I will say this, I, uh, the question last week about the, the uh, class two-way city, Scranton being a class two-way city, um, I, I didn't gloss over that. Uh, I had to do a little bit of research on it, and I did send that to Ms. Franis. There's a... Um, uh, a government uh, handbook, a uh, city government in Pennsylvania handbook that I had sent her uh, this afternoon. Um, it's, it's a long uh, winded answer. I'm not going to go through every portion of it, but for those of you who are interested, uh, Scranton qualified for a second class city status all the way back in 1900. Um, the reason why we're still a, a class two a city is for a couple different reasons. First of all, our, our population did drop uh, significantly, as everybody knows, since the uh, 1930s and 1940s. Um, and we've been given several legislative reprieves to keep our status as a two-way city. Uh, it's only uh, Scranton and the city of Pittsburgh. So in the document that I had sent to Ms. Franis to answer her question that she had asked last week, um, one of the things that does point out, and we all know that the special status that we have as a two-way city also allows of special laws for Scranton. For example, the LST rate that we're able to enact for $156. Uh, that's a benefit of being a class 2A city. And there's many, uh, many other uh, items as well. I believe a few years ago that uh, Councilwoman Evans and, and uh, the, the previous council that she was under did pursue changing the uh, city status to uh, the third class. Um, but it's, it's complicated. It's not as easy as just clicking your fingers and making that move because we may lose some of the uh, benefits of being a class two a city. So again, this is a, a lengthy document that I had sent to Ms. Franis. So hopefully she takes some time uh, to read that. And uh, hopefully that answers her question. Uh, as for the Zoom, uh, Zooming in live, I answered this last week, but I'll answer it again. Council uh, gives the public the opportunity to ask any and all questions. And I do my best personally to answer any and all questions. Now, if you ask me how far the earth is away from the moon, um, I can't come up with that question off the top of my head. Some things require a little bit of research and uh, you have to look into things. You know, I don't claim to have all the answers to all the questions that are posed. Um, we did try to have people uh, call in live way back in the beginning of the pandemic and our meeting was hijacked. Um, so there were some security concerns there. The way that we're doing it now works. People who wanna ask questions, ask them. Their comments are read into the record. The record is publicly available on the city's website. We are on YouTube and channel 19 every single week um, for anyone who wants to know what's going on at a council meeting. The legislation is available, including all of the backup, if anybody's interested on in anything that we're voting on. And if anybody has any relevant questions about the legislation, we certainly, and I certainly entertain them every week. So that's number two. Uh, and finally, Marie Schumacher had a question about the number of people quali qualifying for uh, the alerted designation, designation. And we did get that information that was six people from 2019. So there's an answer to that. Any other uh, people on the question? Okay. All those in favor of introduction signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so on. Fifth order, 5A motion. Councilman Schuster, any motions or comments? No, nothing at this time. Councilman McAndrew, any motions or comments? Yeah, I have uh, just something to report. So I've been receiving um, a lot of questions and concerns about um, the garbage fee being in the bundled in uh, with with the taxes and and I mean of course we think it's, it's a, it is a great idea, uh, but the, the concerns and questions and I had a great conversation with uh, City Treasurer Mary Jo Sheridan last night, um, and I feel that her some of them some questions or, or posed some of them questions to her and concerns like one being and here I'll give you an example so say um, you have an escrow account okay most people do. Um, 
my understanding is that you know it's not unique to this area having fees embedded in with the taxes like the library tax or like abington does german does but there's some mortgage brokers that are outside the area uh, and one resident came to me and said they're like what are we supposed to do with this it's a fee you know what i mean we do a we do an a, a tax analysis and spread everything out we do a tax analysis in say september october and that's when we spread everything out over 12 months this is this is this is unique to us so that the concern from that resident is like, well, can I still pay my garbage fee? Because maybe they're not going to pull it out or, or maybe they're not going to get it in in time. So I asked that question. I, I saw that we recently received an email and the, the frequently asked questions around the website, the city's website now, which is great. It doesn't address some of these concerns, but it addressed a lot of them. Um, some other questions were, well, can I, you know, do I pay the whole thing? You just write one check. And that answer is yes. Do, um, uh, are the taxes built into the, into the city in the school district? Yes, they are. What else did I ask? So now here's what I was told by, by the tax office. I mean, sorry, by uh, uh, the treasurer that, you know, it's the responsibility of the resident to notify, you know, their bank or their mortgage company that this is coming, okay? That they need to plan to, you know, that, that it's included in there. So they have to escrow it. So they have to do that, pull out more $300 a month, you know, $300 a year over 12 months. So, I mean, I did say that, you know, maybe we should have put um, maybe an insert explaining that because residents are concerned about this they're, and, and they're confused. Uh, what else is, did they say? Um, they, have, they understand the layout of it, all right? And, and it goes back to some of the stuff we just said. Um, but I was told and reassured that the, the Treasury's office is, you know, please call them. If they don't, if, if you can't get through them once, call them again. You can, you can, they're willing to help. They're there to help. Uh, they also, um, you know, they'll definitely get back to you. They'll work with you. Um, uh, and, you know, my understanding is the first year is going to be, there's going to be some adjustments. Um, my under, also, they also told me that they've been working on and, and completed a lot of what we brought up last week. Uh, the exoneration process for, you know, say someone owns a duplex, doesn't want to run off the other side. That process is is happening. People are getting exonerations, which is good. So that they, they need, again, to communicate with the, the treasurer's office. Another thing that was brought to me too was, in addition, we have received numerous complaints from constituents that the single tax office is only allowing those paying cash to come inside the office um, and pay to get the receipt upon payment. Seniors in particular have complained about this because, uh, not being able to go inside because they want to pay by check. So they're only accepting cash. You know what happens when we accept cash. We no longer do it in the city. So we got to be careful with that. Um, Cause you know, loss, you know, risk of loss, misappropriation. So what, what else? Um, but I just want to report this out because these concerns I've been getting phone calls since we got our bills last week and, and they're valid concerns. So we got to keep our eye on um, the escrow piece because that might be a problem for folks or, or, or like the local banks, I guess the city contacted, so that's fine, but not everybody deals with a local bank. Uh, there's various mortgage institutions throughout the country that aren't gonna have their head around this and might not pay it. Um, and, and then, you know, they, they miss the grace period or, or, or the discount period. So, um, I had, like I said, I had a great conversation with Mary Jo uh, and she said she's there to help. Any questions, any, any, and she said, any questions that come to you, the rest of us, Please, please give them to her or forward them back in, into that direction so she can address them. All right. Um, and like I said, uh, that was, of course, like that, the new graphic that we just received and it's on the website, you know, that's very helpful too. how to get to people and reach out and, and get their concerns taken care of. Uh, that is all I have. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Dr. Rothschild, any motions or comments? Uh, no, I don't have any motions or comments right now. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councilman Donahue, any motions or comments? I have nothing at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just have a few. There's going to be a meeting tomorrow at 11 a.m. Um, I'm not going to be able to make it. It was short notice. I just found out today about the issues on 3rd Avenue. So the mayor, uh, chief of police, DPW director, other city officials will be there. Um, I know uh, Kevin, our solicitor, Kevin Hayes, is going to be there. I'm not sure if anyone else has copied on it, but Kyle, if you uh, want to attend um, in my place or Mark, there can be two of you. Um, so if you want to work that out between yourselves and anyone is interested um, and you would like to attend that, I can forward you the, uh, the, the Zoom link. 
um, and then hopefully we can update everyone uh, next week. So that was that. Uh, Mark answered a lot of the questions about the uh, garbage fee exemptions, uh, which is good. So the city did put a, a helpful kind of frequently asked question graphic on the website. So if any residents do have any questions, as Councilman McAndrew said, um, go to the website and, and uh, or call the treasurer's office and, and they will help you out. The one thing I think we do have to confirm though, is that it's, it's you know, what I'm hearing from some people is that they're getting the exemption letter from the treasurer's, treasurer's office um, if they're exempt from the garbage fee for whatever reason. Uh, but then when they take it to the single tax office, they're being told that um, they, they can't honor it. So I don't know where the um, mix up is there, but I, I, I did speak to the mayor today uh, briefly. So we're gonna try to confirm that. Um, other than that, I, I just wanted to end with, again, as I said at the beginning of the meeting, um, how you know sorry I am and I know all of us are uh, and, and the prayers that we extend to all those people in our community here in Lackawanna County who have lost a loved one from uh, the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, at this point, we're, we're over 400 people. And the other day we marked a, a, an extraordinary uh, milestone in, in 500,000 people uh, dead in the United States from this virus. And it just, unbelievable to me that we're coming up on a year here um, in March where, you know, the whole country basically shut down. So it really puts things in perspective on how uh, life is, is so very short. And as I mentioned uh, in the remarks at the beginning of the meeting, that it's really easy to become numb to that number because um, we do see that death toll every day in the newspaper and on the news, but um, it's much more than that. And that, you know, we're losing, people are losing fathers and mothers and grandmothers, grandparents, uh, sons and daughters. So again, I, I just wanted to make that remark for the record that uh, our prayers do go out with all the people in our community who have lost somebody uh, to this virus. We're not out of the woods yet, but there is a, a lot of uh, cause for hope with the vaccines and, and um, the numbers going down at this point. So hopefully uh, in the next few months, we'll, we'll start to see the light at the end of the tunnel. I mean, I think we're seeing it now, but hopefully better days are ahead. And that's all I have for tonight. 5B for introduction, a resolution authorizing the mayor and other appropriate city officials to execute the Pennsylvania Department of Transportation policy and procedure for consultant selection form as it relates to working with the Pennsylvania Department of Transportation to select an appropriate engineer consultant for the Multimodal Transportation Funds Grant for the complete replacement of the Ash Street Bridge. At this time, I'll entertain a motion that item 5B be introduced into its proper committee. So moved. Second. On the question. <clears throat> All those in favor of introduction signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it in some 5C for introduction, a resolution authorizing the mayor and other appropriate city officials to execute and enter into the revised agreement for collection of delinquent municipal claims on behalf of the city of Scranton with Portnoff Law, Law Associates LTD for collection of delinquent municipal claims. At this time, I'll entertain a motion that item 5C be introduced into its proper committee. So moved. Second. On the question. On the question, Kevin, just for the record, can you go through again, uh, as you did in the caucus tonight, the changes that uh, have been made to this contract that council had proposed? Oh, you're muted, Kevin. Sorry about that. That's okay. So the uh, the amended agreement uh, between uh, the city and Portnoff, uh, first it specifies the scope of the contract, which is consistent with the um, the RFP. Uh, the scope being that they're they're tasked with co collecting the delinquent refuse fees from 2002 through two through 2020. Um, the agreement would begin uh, uh, would, would would expire in December of 2022 um, the 
the city and Portnoff, if they wish to uh, extend the contract another year uh, on an annual uh, beyond December of 2022, will have to come to council 90 days prior uh, prior to the expiration of the contract. Um, let me think here. What else? The biggest thing the council wanted, uh, which is included in this amended agreement, is to to take to have control over outstanding legal fees and bills that could be amassed during this during the course of this um, contract. So what we requested and what uh, Portnoff has agreed to is that at no, at no time would the city ever be responsible for more than $50,000 worth of legal uh, fees and costs, which they have incurred in, in performance of this contract. Um, why, that's important because in the event that we wanna terminate this agreement for whatever reason, not saying we would want to, but if we wanted to, at the time of termination, we wouldn't be. We would. We would not be responsible for any fees over fifty thousand dollars. And I think the members of council understand why that's important, uh, based on prior vendors uh, and prior contracts that the city had engaged in, prior administrations. That being, uh, however, they the, the cap of fifty thousand does not include uh, fees that um, they will. The, the, the port office is allowed to incur in establishing accounts. There's a $40 uh, initiation fee for each, for each account that, that, that uh, Portnoff um, begins. And anything in excess of $50,000 can, can be paid back to Portnoff once the city receives um, payment from those del delinquent property owners. Um, so those are the major changes. Uh, most of, oh, um, oh, we also, the council proposed the specific uh, grounds for termination that the city would have, um, and those include any violation of any uh, criminal uh, criminal law, a criminal statute, any violation of our the city ethics code uh, would be would be grounds for termination, immediate termination. Again, we all understand why that's important here. So I think that the uh, what we have in front of us is a much improved agreement. Um, and if there's any questions now or over the course of the next few days from, from council, please feel free to bring those to me. Uh, but overall, we've made a, 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 there's been major improvements made to that agreement. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna take the next week to, to continue to go through this contract, but I will say this, the, uh, before the end of last year, what we received, quite frankly, was a bad deal for the city. We received a contract that was not um, a good deal for the taxpayers and the residents of Scranton. So council did its due diligence, uh, took its time, tabled it um, against the opposition of, of, of some uh, in the administration and really took a look at it to make sure that we weren't gonna get raked over the coals um, uh, in terms of signing a contract that wouldn't be in the best interest of the city, uh, the city taxpayers and the city residents. So the deal that we have in front of us, the contract that we have in front of us, uh, I think at first blush is uh, much better than what we had originally received. Um, so council really performed its, its role as uh, oversight and its function as a check um, on you know, the administration and those, those things that come down that we're, we're supposed to look at with a microscope and a magnifying glass. And we did just that. Um, this was especially important uh, to me and I know other members of council in light of the contract that we had previously been in. Uh, so some of the uh, maybe mistakes of the past, I think, have been righted now, um, and we're in a better position as, as a city moving forward, should we ever want to get out of this contract or look at another vendor or uh, maybe bring it in-house, something to that effect. So again, based on my first, uh, my first blush assessment at this contract, uh, I'm pleased. Uh, the second thing I wanted to say was I am disappointed in the fact that um, you know, the, the, the mayor is, is, and that, you know, there's two different opinions, two different uh, sides of this, to, two different ways to look at it, but uh, that the mayor is not on board with the, um, the, the one-time uh, grace period. Um, we did vote on something a, a few weeks ago uh, that I was in favor of, but I don't think it goes far enough. Um, I think, you know, being a distressed city, um, as Scranton is, we're leaving potentially millions of dollars on the table here. Uh, by not having a one-time uh, grace period for uh, delinquent uh, people who owe delinquent refuse fees. Um, I know there's some people out there that disagree with that, but 
we're in a position where we need uh, money for next year. We're looking down the barrel of four million in the area of a four million dollar deficit. So this is a creative way to come up with that money. The administ the mayor and, and her administration uh, see it another way, and that's fine. I just am disappointed because I think we're leaving uh, some some um, serious dollars on the table. Uh, the the one question that I do have that I'd like to get answered before a final passage is on the contract that we did have with NRS. There was a question that was uh, posed in um, last year, I think in November and December, of how much we actually owe NRS as we were parting ways with them. So there was a number that was thrown around, I think, when Solicitor O'Brien was in our caucus. Um, I'd like to know if we have a definitive number, what we actually, what the city's actually going to owe them, if anything. I don't know. But if we could find that out, um, I'd appreciate that. And then the, the other thing that I'll end with tonight is just to, uh, we'll check with the, I'd like to check with the administration to make sure that um, everybody's still on board with uh, potentially having the county uh, collect delinquent refuse fees moving forward. Um, I know that that was also uh, a point of discussion when we were talking about this last year. So we'll make sure that uh, that, that has not changed. Anyone else on the question? Um, yes, uh, I, I have to agree with President Gahan. I think we got a much better deal here. Um, my goal in looking at this contract um, a few weeks ago was to avoid the pitfalls and the mistakes of that last contract. And, you know, if we were ever to get in a situation where we were unhappy with, with the deal, we can get out of it without, um, without having to pay the company off. So I'm um, uh, happy to say that the suggestions I put in uh, were um, taken into consideration and added to this. And at this point in time, I'm happy with uh, what we have in front of us tonight. Thank you. Anyone else on the question? Okay, very good. All those in favor of introduction signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Thanks so much. 5D for introduction of resolution, authorizing the mayor and other appropriate city officials to execute and enter into a contract between the city of Scranton and the Scranton School District with Robert Rossi and company to perform the Scranton, excuse me, the Scranton single tax office independent audit for fiscal years ending December 31, 2019 and December 31, 2020. This time I'll entertain a motion that item 5D be introduced into its proper committee. So moved. Second. On the question. On the question, uh, Lori, if we can just get the other, who the other bidders were uh, for this in the bid amounts. Um, I know moving forward, and this this was uh, submitted before I had brought this up, but I know that moving forward uh, on this legislative cover sheet, we were gonna add in a line um, just moving forward so that they always put in who the names of the other bidders and the bid amount, because um, I think that, that makes sense. Anyone else on the question? All those in favor of introduction signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. 5E for introduction of resolution authorizing the mayor and other appropriate city officials to execute and enter into a master lease agreement between the city of Scranton, here and after designated lessor and Selco partnership doing business as Verizon Wireless with its principal offices at one Verizon Way, Mail Stop 4AW100, Basking Ridge, New Jersey 07920, Lessee, to lease space to Lessee with respect to particular sites at which Lessee wishes to install, maintain, and operate small cell communications equipment, as well as any and all necessary lease supplements outlined herein. At this time, I'll entertain a motion that item 5E be introduced into its proper committee. So moved. Second. On the question? On the question, uh, this is another example of the original legislation that we received last year. Again, I didn't feel was in the best interests of the, uh, the residents of our city and the residents specifically in our neighborhoods. Um, it came down to us with no design standards 
included in here. So Verizon, you know, uh, th there wasn't any sort of standards that were located in the legislation. So um, I got together with Solicitor Hayes and uh, he was able to uh, work with Don King, our city planner and uh, members of the administration so that uh, the city is now gonna incorporate the design standards into this legislation, which will be folded into the changes that are gonna be made through the Scranton Abington uh, Planning Association, SAPA. Um, Kevin, do you have anything to, to add to that? No, so what you, what's before council now is an amended uh, agreement between um, uh, Verizon and, and the city, as uh, council president just indicated, uh, the legislation was, was initially uh, introduced in December. We tabled it because there was no design standards um, included in the agreement. Basically, the agreement said um, if, if new design standards are adopted after the, this agreement is executed, Verizon won't be subject to them because the agreement was signed prior to that. Now, we all know that Don King and, and others are working very hard to, de to develop the, the comprehensive SAPA plan, which is almost near um, implementation. So what we did was we incorporated the design standards that were for small um, cell facilities, which were developed by SAPA, uh, and we included those in, um, in this agreement so that there are now certain standards that Verizon and any other wireless provider going forward will have to um, uh, follow with regard to setbacks, with regard to size, with regard to height, um, because obviously, as you understand, these are going to be more and more prevalent in the city. They're important for, for our citizens to have these, these cell towers so that we have as much coverage um, in, in, as possible, but we don't want to, um, you know, have cell coverage um, without also having protection of the aesthetic um, you know, beauty of the city and the architectural integrity of the city. So, uh, we, we we got those in there, and um, going now going forward, every every wireless provider will be subject to the same uh, design standards. Thanks, Kevin, and I I want to thank too Don King, our city planner. Um, he's a huge asset uh, to the city, and really he, he's been working for the city so long and has so much knowledge. Uh, you know, I always call him the encyclopedia of City Hall, because if you have a question about anything related to um, the city, about uh, planning, you know, he's really the go-to person. So I, I do want to thank him because he um, he answers answers you right away when you have a question for him. Very helpful. Anyone else on the question? All those in favor of introduction signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it in some way. First order. 6A, no business at this time. Seventh order, 7A for consideration by the Committee on Rules for Adoption, file of the Council number 52, 2021, amending file of the Council number 11, 2020, entitled Approving the Transfer of a Restaurant Liquor License Owned by Oak Street Express, LLC, 610 North Main Street, Taylor, Lackawanna County, Pennsylvania, 18517. Restaurant Liquor License number R-3114, to Aradahe Dev Beer LLC, the Mini Mart, 401 Wyoming Avenue and Mulberry Street, Scranton, Lackawanna County, Pennsylvania, 18503, as required by the Pennsylvania Liquor Control Board to include additional requirements per the Pennsylvania Liquor Control Board. As chairperson for the Committee on Rules, I recommend final passage of item 7A. Second. On the question. Roll call, please. Mr. Schuster? Yes. Mr. McAndrew? Yes. <clears throat> Dr. Rothschild? Yes. Mr. Donahue? Yes. Mr. Vaughn? Yes, I hereby declare item 7A legally and lawfully adopted. 7B for consideration by the Committee on Finance for adoption. File of the Council number 53, 2021. Amending file of the Council number 67, 2014, entitled amending file of the council number 52, 1903 entitled an ordinance as amended relating to dogs, the licensing of and dog pound therefore, and providing for a fund and regulating the payment of bills for the treatment for the prevention of hydrophobia by decreasing license fees by amending section 1A 
to change the fees of the current dog licenses for all dogs within the city limits. What's the recommendation of the chairperson for the Committee on Finance? As the chairperson for the Committee on Finance, I recommend final passage of 7B. Second. Second. On the question? On the question, I'll be voting for this piece of legislation. I think it's very important that we do everything in our power um, to make sure that any type of fee in the city is affordable for our residents. The fee that was in place for the dog license was just you know, it was very expensive and I have to pay it every single year. It was very onerous on our uh, residents. So this brings it in line with other communities and I think it's much more affordable. So I'll be voting yes. Anyone else on the question? Mr. President, on the question? Yes. Uh, on the question, um, Councilman McAndrew, you had, inquire, you had asked me to inquire as to whether uh, the city currently imposes any type of delinquent fees or or, or penalties for failure uh, for dog owners to um, to to make the, to pay this license fee, and the response that I got from Eileen Cipriani is that they do not uh, they do not penalize people for not paying the license fee, and they don't pursue delinquent fees. Um, that's the current practice. Okay, thanks. I just want to wrap my head around the process because it wasn't. Right. Cool. I, know, I didn't understand it myself, so that's that's the uh, explanation I got. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else on the question? Roll call, please. Mr. Schuster? Yes. Mr. McAndrew? Yes. Dr. Rothschild? Yes. Mr. Donahue? Yes. Mr. Gone? Yes, I hereby declare item 7B legally and lawfully adopted. 7C for consideration by the Committee on Rules for Adoption. Resolution number 127, 2021, appointment of Jennifer Davis, 801 North Irving Avenue, Scranton, Pennsylvania, 18510, to serve as a member of the Planning Commission. Ms. Davis will be replacing Catherine Borer, whose term expired on December 31, 2020. The term of Ms. Davis is effective January 8, 2021, and will expire on December 31, 2024. As chairperson for the Committee on Rules, I recommend final passage of item 7C. Second. On the question. Roll call, please. Mr. Schuster? Yes. Mr. McAndrew? Yes. Dr. Rothschild? Yes. Mr. Donahue? Yes. Mr. Gone? Yes, I hereby declare item 7C legally and lawfully adopted. 7D. For consideration by the Committee on Rules for Adoption, Resolution Number 128, 2021, appointment of Tom Welby, 119 Park Drive, Scranton, Pennsylvania, 18505, as a member of the Scranton Municipal Recreation Authority, effective ever, excuse me, February 2, 2021. Mr. Welby will be replacing Gerald J. Smurl, who resigned December 31, 2020. Mr. Welby will fill the unexpired term of Gerald J. Smurl which will expire on May 31, 2023. As chairperson for the Committee on Rules, I recommend final passage of item 7D. Second. Second. On the question? On the question, uh, I wanna thank Mr. Smurl for all of his work and uh, the way he volunteered up at Nayog Park and for the Recreation Authority Board. You know, these people that volunteer on these boards are the, some of the uns, unsung heroes of the city of Scranton. You often don't hear about them, you often don't see them, but they're the ones that are doing the work. Uh, Mr. Smurl, I know, was <clears throat> up at Neog Park day in and day out, still is, um, even though he won't uh, be on the board any longer, but he did a phenomenal job um, up there and really poured his heart and soul into, the, into that park. I wanna welcome also Mr. Welby, um, Mr. Welby does a lot for our community. He'll be a great addition to the board. And, um, you know, I'm starting to think that he has a body double because he's involved in so many different boards and um, does so much for the community, but he's, he's a great addition and, and I know he'll do a great job. Anyone else on the question? Yes, thank you, Mr. Swir uh, Mr. Smurl and good luck, Tom. As always. Thank you. On the question, anyone else? Roll call, please. Mr. Schuster. Yes. Mr. McAndrew? Yes. Dr. Rothschild? Yes. Mr. Donahue? Yes. 
Mr. Collin. Yes, I hereby declare item 7D legally and lawfully adopted. Eighth order, old business, file of the council number 50, 2021, amending section 709G of the city of Scranton zoning ordinance, prohibiting signs or displays that include words or images that are obscene, pornographic, or that an average reasonable person would find highly offensive to public decency. This piece of legislation was tabled following introduction and remains currently tabled. Next Tuesday, March 2nd, there will be a public hearing at 5.45 p.m. At, the, at that meeting, or I'm sorry, at the meeting immediately following, I will entertain a motion to place this piece in sixth order for a second reading. On March 9th, it is expected to be in seventh order for a final vote. If anyone wishes to speak on this piece of legislation or provide comment for the public hearing next week, you may do so by emailing lreed at scrantonpa.gov or by US mail at Scranton Municipal Building, 340 North Washington Avenue, Scranton, PA 18503, attention city clerk's office by 3 p.m. next Tuesday, March 2nd. And before we adjourn the meeting tonight, um, I did wanna mention one thing I forgot to in, uh, during the earlier in the meeting. Uh, when I spoke to the mayor earlier today, she did inform me that the clerical contract ha has been approved by the clerical union. So we should uh, see legislation forthcoming within the next week or two. Um, uh, so probably next week or the week after. If there's no further business, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. This meeting is adjourned. Thanks, everyone. See